Yeah, today we have Max and Sue. So if you guys could introduce yourselves quickly, Sue will start with you, then that'd be fantastic. Okay, hi everybody. Um, some of you might remember me from uh, my earlier success in this webinar series, the LinkedIn uh, session. So I run a digital marketing agency in Cambridge called Sukio, and uh, I specialise in digital content really. So I've worked for all sorts of people over the years like the BBC and ITV.com and uh, Yahoo, Government Digital Services. And so I know lots about um, copywriting, social media and all sorts of kind of digital content. Thank you. Uh, I'm Max Rushton. Uh, at the moment, I am uh, the host of the Guardian Football Weekly podcast and the warm-up on talk sports and pretty much every other talk sports show when that presenter um, calls in sick slash drunk five minutes before they're on air. Um, I write for the Guardian um, pretty regularly, um, but, but not sort of day in, day out. And most importantly, I'm the voice of Gaviscon. Uh, the two cartoon firemen inside, you know, the soothes down to two minutes and lasts up to four hours. So I'm very happy to take any indigestion or heartburn based questions <laughs> from anyone. We learn something new every day. So, I mean, everyone's already... It's my most stable them. employer, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, before we kick off, obviously, we're, we're here to talk about kind of blogging and writing. But so if you'd like to whack in the chat, um, if you, if you have any experience of doing that or where you are with doing that, perhaps you haven't started, perhaps you have started, perhaps you're super experienced. If you just let us know, um, that'd be pretty cool. So yeah, we're going to kick off with why blog. So yeah, Sue, if you could just start us off with why bother? Why bother in the first place? Yeah, I think uh, the main reason is to, is to get your own voice out there. So it's taking control of your own narrative. And um, particularly if we're thinking about life after professional sports, it might be that you're keen to change tack completely. So you've always been known as a cricketer or rugby player or whatever, um, whereas now you're going into something completely different, uh, maybe in finance or property. So it's quite a good way of kind of taking control of that and helping people um, get a new perspective on you. And then the other thing is that it gives you original content you can share. So some of you might already be um, have your own podcast, um, or you might be active on other parts of social media. So when you've got your own blog, it gives you something to share rather than other people's insights. So it means that you've got this original, interesting content, um, which is all yours, <laughs> nobody else's. So you're not just having to repeat other people's uh, perspectives, then you've got your own. Um, it's also very good for being found on the web as well. So if you're writing, um, uh, say if you're blogging for another site other than one that you own yourself, then this is going to come up really high in the searches. So like Max's posts on the Guardian website, um, you know, it's one of the most visited websites uh, around these days. So all of those posts are going to gonna, um, come up really high in searches and then be good for, for your profile. So that's, that's a few thoughts for me. Um, over to you, Max. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you sort of talked about making your own content. What I found really interesting is someone who is essentially a broadcaster who hadn't really written anything for about 20 years and, and sort of started last year, really. Um, I was very lucky in that I was on a platform because of the podcast that I was doing that The Guardian were like, yeah, we're happy for you to fill up a page and, you know, actually publish it without editing it too much. And in a way that was good for me because I think for a blog, you need a lot of self-motivation, right? The, the beauty of someone telling you to do it is you have a deadline. And I think the hardest thing about a blog is if you don't publish anything, you're not going to get told off, right? Or no one's going to email you going, where is this post? And I think that probably the hardest part of it is actually motivating yourself to do it and setting yourself a, a target of two a month or four a month or, or whatever you want to do. But I think in terms of you said as creating your own content, what I found quite interesting about the difference between broadcasting is, you know, hopefully in the last 15 or 16 years, I don't know, I have said some interesting things on air, on TV or radio that is open to debate, but hopefully I've said some things that are interesting, but social media has changed it slightly, but even still, it's a much less lasting bit of content. Like you, it, it's changed a bit because, you know, people will take a bit of James O'Brien or whoever and put out a minute on social media. But if you make a point 
on the TV or on the radio, unless people are listening or watching at that time, or unless the social media team cut it and put it out on social media, it's kind of gone. Which in a way is good because it means you can talk a lot of rubbish and, and people forget about it. But when you write something, it's really lasting. Okay, so, you know, before this session, Ben was like, can you send us some articles? And it's really easy for, for me to find three or four that I've written. If he'd said, can you send five bits of sort of on-air content that are useful, actually it'd be much harder to find. So I think in a sense, you can start to sort of curate or you can build a, a portfolio of stuff that is yours, right? And it's completely yours and it's completely personal. And, you know, the advantage I think of writing over broadcasting is that you can, I mean, it's, an, it's a double-edged sword, right? I find it much more difficult because I'm much less used to doing it, but also you can keep going back to it and going back to it and going back to it. There's, it's never going to be perfect. And I find sometimes, even when I've read through it, you know, for the hundredth time, I'm sort of nervous to press send because then it's gone. But at least I've had that time to curate it. Whereas if you're broadcasting, you say something and you just hope that it's good. And then when it's said it's gone and you can't edit and check it. So I think if you're just starting out, you have much more, this is, this is the medium that you have most control over. And before I sort of keep on blathering away, I mean, why do it? You know, in, in the media, I guess, what you've got written, talking at radio and TV, and that's sort of it. So you might as well do all of them because actually you need as many strings to your bow as possible. So if you can, if you, if you have the ability to, all of the, to do all of them and the opportunity, then it's, a, it's just a no brainer, I guess. It seems I like think it's the, um, sorry, the, um, the longevity factor, I think, is really important as well. I mean, I've been blogging on various uh, places for, for years now, and I can look back, and when I, if I were to look myself up on the internet, which isn't really something I'd spend a lot of time doing, but there's, there's frequently stuff that comes up that I need to refer back to, and it's all, it's all out there, like this kind of body of work. And there's a couple of posts that we've done for Sukio, which I think Google must have taken as a little snippet, so an answer to a question. And these, even though some of them are about five years old, there's one on uh, what to do if you make a, new, a mistake when you send out a, an email newsletter. Um, this continually brings more traffic to the site than anything else that we publish. And there's one on um, Instagram strategy. And again, for some reason, that is the answer to a question and Google brings that up as an answer to something people are looking up on the internet. Um, and so whatever else we put out there, this always gets five times as many hits every month. So it's kind of out there, not just as a part of your body of work, but then it can actually be quite a useful driver of traffic as well. So if you think a lot around questions that people need answers to, so problems that people um, need to be solved and write in a way that you're sharing helpful and practical information with you, uh, with people, then sometimes inadvertently, um, it can really kind of be, could be quite a big hit and have quite a long tail on it, if you like, you know, so just, just keep on bringing, um, bringing you benefits. Okay, I think that leads us in really nicely to, yeah, where you get your ideas from. So how do you choose what to write about? Like, where do you get ideas from? How do you kind of keep ahead of that? So yeah, Sue, so if you could just kick us off. Well, this is, um, this is a question that we get asked quite a lot, really. So um, I see quite a common pattern. So someone writes the first blog post, and they put everything into it, all their thoughts, all their insights, all their perspectives. Um, like Max is saying, kind of a bit nervous about pressing send or publish, um, and that's gone. And then you struggle with blog post number two, and then you maybe get blog post number two out, and then by the time it gets to number three, you think, oh God, I wish I hadn't started this. And so the internet is littered with these, uh, you know, these blogs that have only got one or two posts in. Um, but so it's, it's really important if you just sit down maybe once a month and just plan a series of posts, then it takes the pressure off. And so there's several kind of um, pillars, if you like, that you can build these around. So you can think about what's topical. So there might be something like the World Cup or the Olympics, anything that's happening that you can use as an angle. There's seasonal stuff, um, Easter, Christmas, Halloween, all that kind of thing. Um, there might be new things that you're doing. So maybe you're forming a partnership with a particular sports brand, um, or there might be, it might be the new season in your particular sport. So uh, there might be something you can talk about there. Um, there could be a particular controversy 
um, in your sport as well, uh, you know, a particular manager moving clubs or whatever. Um, so if you kind of take these pillars to start you off, then little by little you think, well, actually, that's about 10 posts. So then it feels a bit more like your attention is sort of spread over quite a few instead of putting all your energy into one perfect post, which you won't want to publish because it's never going to be quite right. Um, and I'm also a fan of maybe writing a few in one go, so doing a batch. And again, that, that takes the pressure off. So yeah, if you kind of structure it a bit like that, I've got a blog post that I can share around that, that's got that um, featured. So it kind of gives you that, that structure really. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't want to talk too much each time. <laughs> no, no, dude, crack on. I'm taking notes. <laughs> that's great. So we've got these posts as well and um, we'll follow up with everyone here and send them an email with all the links into these sorts of things. So yeah, I mean, those are ready to go. What about you, Max? How do you, what sort of cadence are you publishing? on and yeah do you need the you said you need the deadline do you do you write the last minute how do you get your ideas that's it, it like what's interesting what sue was saying about you know i have definitely stared at a laptop with nothing on it you know in like a trendy artisan cafe before they were all closed and thought oh shit i have got, i've got nothing to i have nothing to say right now i have nothing you know you, you pressured some boss to say give me this opportunity and now i've got nothing to say I think um, specifically from, you know, people who've been sports, you know, been in professional sport, what they, where you, you're lucky is you've done something that people are interested in, right? So I, there are sort of, from my point of view, there are, there are sort of two, two sort of things that I've, I've focused on quite a lot. And the easy slash lazy option actually is not is actually can be really good which is the really personal one right if you um you know i can talk about you know how i hated playing rugby at school right because it was cold and there was just always bigger boys and i just had to sort of lie in the mud and hold the ball when it was too windy and someone would kick my finger off and no one can you know in terms of journalism nobody can sort of fact check that right because it was me and it was totally personal to me. And you will have lots of personal stories from your, from, from your past, which I find sort of not necessarily easier to write about, but much more of a flow. If I say, right, I'm going to write about um, amateur football, which I've written about quite a lot. I love playing. My knees don't love it anymore. But I, there's a huge, um, you know, a lot of people play amateur sport of different, uh, you know, different levels and different, codes and whatever so if i write about that that can be very personal it doesn't really require buckets of journalistic research because hey it's my life you know no no one people can abuse me on twitter because they think it's rubbish but they can't abuse me and say actually that didn't happen or this didn't happen unless they were also at school with me um and so i i i think part of those things is they they resonate, right? I, I think I wrote a piece which you'll send out about the Champions League final where my dad's a massive Spurs fan. They're my big team who win things, I know. And I gave my ticket up to watch it with my dad. And it was quite an emotional thing to write about. But actually, if you're writing a piece which is, I love football and I love my dad, that's going to resonate with a lot of people because a lot of people have dads and love football. And so I wasn't trying to think about it in a cynical way, but I think what you want to do is try and engage a lot of people. And so if you think of things that have happened in your life that will resonate with other people, then that's quite a sensible way to go. And the other piece that I think we might talk about a bit is about Kobe Bryant when he died in the helicopter crash. And I mean, that's completely revert the complete opposite. I don't follow basketball at all, but I found the story obviously tragic. And I found his story fascinating the difficult sides of him off the pitch and the glorious sides of him on the pitch and related that to something that I could relate to, which is how we deal with tragedy on social media, because we've all had to deal with that. We've all been in these situations where somebody we know or somebody we don't know has passed away. And then we sort of wrestle with whether we need to say something or not. And so I took a story that I didn't really know much about, but turned it into something that I felt more confident discussing. But having said that, I was very, I'm not sure if nervous is the way, right word, but I was very wary about pressing send on that article 
and I was very wary about how that would be received because I was talking about some pretty um, difficult subjects and about something that I wasn't an expert and people wouldn't necessarily expect me to write about. Um, but that shouldn't necessarily stop you. So I think the short version of that answer is personal stuff is great because you know it better than anyone else. Um, and stuff that you think other people will be interested in, right? Because then more people will read it. We've had a really good question come in. Um, so saying, how do you sort of, and you, you, you've just touched on it there, so it leads in quite nicely, but how do you maybe, if you're writing topical posts, how do you distinguish yourself from everybody else? Because obviously things that are topical are topical, everybody will write about them. How do you make that stand out? And Max, you've just touched on it there a little bit by um, you know, introducing a sort of another a personal twist on it. What about you, Sue? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think to have that personal angle is really good. Um, because the thing is a blog, you gotta remember it's different to a news article. You know, it's not a press release, it's not a news report saying the the exact facts of what happened. It, it's a perspective. So if you can go in on a slightly more personal angle, that's that's really good. And it doesn't have to be um it doesn't always have to be emotional, um, you know, or you know, like a tearjerker, but it can as long as if you bring in a bit more of your own personal insight. And that's what makes it interesting because there's a lot of people that are just um, what I tend to call throwing shit at the internet all day. So they're using, uh, they're, they're finding keywords, and then they're just writing stuff to go with it because they know it will appear in searches. However, if you're writing something from a more personal angle, which draws on your experience and gives more of a deeper insight, then that's going to bring you greater benefits over time because more people will spend time on the page actually reading the thing instead of just being kind of bought there and then clicking away, realizing it's no good. So I think, yeah, to make yourself stand out, to, to draw in that that personal perspective all the time, I think is really good because then you're you're developing your own voice. Um, and another thing I find with blogging that's interesting is is that we all, when we first start out, we all sort of sweat over getting it right, and you know we're going back and deleting things. Oh, should I say it like that? And particularly if you're writing from a slightly more personal angle. But the thing about your very first blog post is that no one's really reading it. <laughs> you know, it's uh, over time as you get you get more and more into it and you get more and more followers. That's when people are starting to read what you're writing a bit more, um, which is great because then by that time you've hit your stride. Whereas, um, yeah, in those early days when you're kind of saying, "Oh, this is my first post. I'm not really sure what I'm doing here," then actually it's fine. You know, people are quite forgiving. So, writing about topical um, subjects is really good because you're catching the the moment um, and over time you'll you'll find your voice you know you'll, you'll get better better at it um, and when you realize that people are actually reading it that can help um, and that again can help you kind of refine your approach to things so you might find that you write a particularly emotive post you share that on twitter you get loads of response or maybe you get just tumbleweed and people prefer your more kind of straightforward posts and then that can guide you a little bit as well i think a bit of feedback can be quite rewarding and it makes you feel like what you're writing is is received you know people actually want to want to read it yeah i think that's a really good point actually like i'm very thankful that my first radio shows were, uh, were on a radio station that no one listened to because they were <laughs> terrible and you know i could be rubbish and no one cared i'm yeah. also very pleased that twitter didn't exist when i started soccer am because that would have been really <laughs> quite brutal yeah, yeah. but but like the key is yeah, practice, right? And 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 uh, there's an interesting point about you know the blank screen and and thinking why have I started doing this? The page that I quite often write on the Guardian, the sort of the, the comment piece, I guess that genuinely brilliant journalists like Marina Hyde and Barney Ronay do, and they've had but they've had people in the past, Russell Brand, Daro Brian, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who kind of wanted a Guardian column because it's a cool thing to have, and were really sort of proficient for four weeks, and then were like. Oh no, I've got to do this every week. So like, it's okay to like stare at a blank screen. You know, if people as talented as that are doing it, then, you know, the rest of us can also feel okay with not knowing what to say sometimes, you know. I also find that walking away from the screen is really helpful. So there's loads of times when I've been trying to come up with a title and it's not quite gelling. And I'm looking at it thinking, oh, I know there's something wrong here. And then I've gone to make a cup of tea or, you know, I've switched my brain to something completely different. And then it all seems to fall into place. So, you know, it might be that you're thinking about the blog post while you're sitting there in front of the screen, it's not happening, but then you get out on your bike and then your mind relaxes that little bit. Um, and then the ideas sort of start falling into place. 
So yeah, it's strange really. The, the worst place sometimes to be uh, writing anything is actually at the computer. <laughs> With yeah. a bit of luck, you can write it in your head on that long bike ride, come back and then. Yeah, and also you just, like you say, you get into a stride. The first ones I did, which were when did Spurs get into the Champions League final? So last season? Yeah, it feels a long time ago. So it's not long. You know, I would agonise for hours and hours and hours and I would never think my deadline's 11 a.m. I've got to have it done the night before. Whereas sort of now I could write something on the Tuesday and think, actually, I don't like it and get up early and go to a cafe and bash one out in two hours. And it'd be, uh, you know, it'd be OK. It, like, it, good enough to, for them to be OK with it. Thank you for those who sniggered at that phrase. I appreciate it. <laughs> wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> no, we're all very mature like uh the world's smart muted um but yeah where the um the spurs piece in particular so that's obviously something that everybody's writing about when it's on at the time it's the, it's the football event of the year so what maybe gave you the idea to kind of um yeah to put a twist on it what where where did that come from it's a good question actually because interestingly that was that piece i hadn't been asked to write anything I just didn't have anything to do that day. And I thought it was quite, I think because, you know, when Spurs had got through against Ajax, right? And it was a totally ridiculous game. And I had a ticket for the final. And I'm, they still use that photo from like 10 years ago when my hair you look was great. Up. You look great. Uh, thanks so much. It's all Gavis Scott. And so really, I just sat in a cafe and just thought, this is a story that I kind of want to tell and I'll send it to the sports editor and maybe he'll hate it and maybe he won't. Um, and so I just wrote it. And I think, I think it's an interesting point when you're writing about something that everything is, everybody is writing about, you do need to think of something different. Specifically, if you're doing that comment bit, which a blog ultimately is, no one's going to go to your blog for a match report, right? Because someone else has done that match report or like, but, you know, if you are an ex-footballer and you have seen something tactically, well, then you can say, well, look, this is why Liverpool beat Spurs in this final, apart from that terrible handball decision. But, you know, if you can say, actually, what no one has spotted yet is this. Um, and I think from an ex-pros perspective, I think it's, you know, what's, what I think is sort of more difficult now than 20 or 30 years ago is there are lots of people trying to do it, especially in football. And so... I guess what you need to do is, is like find your voice. It's a sort of terrible cliche, but it's, it's what do you do that others don't necessarily do? So Danny Higginbottom's a good example of someone who doesn't necessarily have a, you know, there's a, there's a definite truth in if you've got five European cups, you can sort of turn up to a studio and people will listen to you regardless of whether you've done any prep or not. If you haven't, you have to think of, okay, what, what, what am I saying here? And so he's, he's sort of developed a bit of a niche tactically. And, you know, I didn't watch him enough as a player to know if he was just tactically completely on point. And so as soon as he came off the pitch, he knew everything that had happened. But over time, he's worked out, this is something that he can say that people now would view him as, rightly or wrongly, but would view him as an authority. You know, not everyone's going to agree with him, but see, actually, he's got an authority on that bit of football for example whereas you might start writing and find out you're actually really bloody funny and then why not crack on with that it's that will come from however much you practice and so I think if you're starting and, and it's definitely worth thinking about look if you're starting and you want to get into the media right and so you, you're looking at tv radio written everything if you if you've done loads of them, like if you've done your own podcast or if you've done your own YouTube stuff or you've done your own written stuff, then when you get asked to do it by a newspaper or by a radio station, you'll just be so much more relaxed. And, and listeners and viewers and readers don't think that anyone's going to be nervous. Like that there is just a presumption that if you are on air anywhere or you've put this piece out, that you are 100% confident in what you're delivering. And that just isn't true because people are trying things they've never done before. So like every ex-pro that comes on the radio, you know, the listener is thinking, well, they're on the radio, they must be confident. But it's not, that just isn't true because if they've never done it before or they're just not sure of their surroundings. Whereas if, if the first time you get asked onto TalkSport or Five Live or whoever, you know, you've been doing a podcast for two years, you'll just be comfortable with, 
putting a pair of headphones on and chatting. And it's the same principle for, for writing, I think. I just thought this was an, this is an interesting thing to look at as well. I mean, apart from being just a, I really enjoyed reading it, but you're right because it just starts with a lot of personal, you know, personal pronouns. So why I gave away my Champions League final ticket to watch it with dad. It's kind of, apart from having a Champions League final ticket, it's, you know, really relatable. And it's I, yeah. and then with the subtitle as well, I will be in Madrid. And then on yeah. Saturday, I will wake up in Madrid. I mean, interestingly, I didn't write either of those two <laughs> things. Someone else wrote that, you know, um, which is quite an interesting insight, I guess, as well. That's really interesting because I sometimes think I use the word I too much when I'm writing compared to the really brilliant ones. But, you know, if, if I tried to emulate Marina Hyde or Barney, Ronnie, I wouldn't even bother starting. Do you know what I mean? They're just at such a level. I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's like, would Robbie Simpson have tried to be a footballer because he'd watch Zidane and go, well, there's no point because I'm not going to get to that level, if you see what I mean. But actually, I can have, <laughs> you know, so, so you have to, like, it, it, it's... I sometimes feel that that could be a really accurate criticism of mine is that it's way too personal and self-indulgent. But lots of people aren't doing that. Certainly, you know, I suspect some really, so I don't know, I don't ask lots of journalists what they think of it because I wonder if they'll think it's just too self-indulgent. I mean, there are loads of pieces I've done that I like that. You know, I hated rugby at school. I liked football at school. You know, I haven't got to hockey yet, but I'll get onto it at some point, you know. I, think I just pick up on this a little bit as well because um, I just think it's a... It's a really interesting point. Um, so when we're talking to businesses about how to write their website copy, then I quite often point out to people, how many times do you say we in this bit of written work and you don't say you at all? So you see lots of businesses that say, we're an award-winning whatever, we've, you know, we're in 15 different countries, we've got 60,000 staff, and at no point does it say you, know, you and talk about you and your problem and how we'll help you solve them. But I think with blogs, then talking about things from your own personal experience is actually, is actually fine. Um, and that, that's what makes it different to other types of digital content. You know, this is your little corner. Uh, so you may as well be um, as confident as possible. You know, you are the expert here. A lot of people feel a bit kind of, well, you know, particularly football, where everyone's got an opinion. So you might feel like, oh, well, you know, it's just me with my opinion here and other people know more than me. But your, your opinion is, uh, and your expertise is still really important. So um, even if you do feel a bit unconfident with it, then just sort of fake it till you make it. You know, it's, it's a written word. You can always kind of, I don't know, kind of give yourself a boost. You can enhance things. So try and be really sort of bold um, and clear with what you're saying, even if you feel a bit sort of, oh, I'm probably not the expert on this topic. Don't, don't admit that anywhere. Keep that to yourself, you know, bite, bite your lip. Don't say that because it makes it sound a bit woolly. Can I just pick up on that a little bit? Because so we've had Nikki earlier said that she'd written some articles for a magazine a few years ago and was looking to build her own business and brand now. And so if you, I mean, you've, you've kind of touched on it there a little bit, but what would the difference be if you're, if you're building your personal brand and if you're building maybe a brand, it could still be based around you and your expertise, but what would be the difference in those blogs? If you see what I mean, would you write as we in one and I in the other or... You know, what, how do you kind of make that decision? I, th I think it depends, really. Um, so say if you're someone you've had a really you've overcome lots of challenges um, and you're using that almost as part of your personal brand. So you, you're going to be you've turned that into becoming a leadership coach or something. And you talk about your, um, you know, your battle with bereavement or um, overcoming cancer or, you know, so something like that or some sporting uh, challenge, you know, big event that everyone knows about then you might want to sort of you're bringing that into your brand you're making that part of you or if you're someone that's switching things completely then then you wouldn't necessarily do that because you might think well okay that happened but that's not what I'm about now so yeah without kind of evading the question it, it sort of depends on what that brand is that you're growing um so yeah I think the main thing is though once you decide you need to kind of stick to it and build upon it so you can have lots of different formats within the blog so you might have some blogs that are real kind of helpful how-to pieces um some that are a bit more personal some that you've done on video some that are a list of you know 10 things that you could do about xyz well i always like having an odd number instead of an even one because it just looks a bit more like you've really thought about it instead of just trying to do uh 10 which is a bit boring 
Um, I quite like having things like 77 or, you know, like loads. Anyway, um, but yeah, so once you've got that tone of voice, you've decided what that sort of niche is that you're ca carving out, then you need to try and stick within that, you know, try and build upon it, um, but stay within that area. Because if you, say if you're writing about football, one post is really witty um, and crazy, the other one is more of a serious match report, then it, it's not gonna, over time, it's gonna be a bit confusing for people. So maybe sort of play around at the beginning trying to get that tone of voice but then once you've got it try, just try and try and stick with it and make that common across all of the different platforms so again say if you've got a podcast and on that you're uh you're having loads of banter and it's really witty and hilarious and then on your blog then it's a lot more serious and heavyweight then the two aren't going to quite match and there'll be you in the middle of that on twitter thinking oh i don't know how i talk you know um but i think with what you're yeah, doing I, I think that, based I around think you Sorry, I'm sorry to jump in. I think that's really interesting because I've found it much, i found, although we cover everything on air, you know, every possible story, we, we definitely veer to light, you know, it's yeah. definitely sort of lighthearted and, you know, I err towards being silly and mucking about. This is probably the most serious I've been for 35 solid minutes in a, in a long time. But, but when I write, I've found it much easier or I've found it possible to have a slightly different um, approach to it and be slightly, um, sort of slightly more measured or slightly more serious. I mean, I think, I sort of think, um, you know, you, you probably you probably have to be able to do all of it, right? It, I mean, there are, there are different ways of doing any sort of story. So, you know, because in real life everyone will experience really funny stuff and really sad stuff and humdrum boring stuff most of the time and I suppose if you can find a way of retaining a kind of identity but covering death and destruction and tragedy and whoopee cushions and whatever then um that that is a yeah, that's great if you manage to do that I'm not saying I have managed to do it I have no idea but I think yeah, it's a, it's a really hard balance between pigeonholing yourself and and like being good at something, right? I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, right. Um, thank you. The so in terms of making a post, like so when you're when you're writing something, is there a sort of particular I know there's not gonna be one formula that you follow, but what tends to make a good piece when you're satisfied with something? What like are there kind of um particular guidelines you follow for instance Sue what about what do you think yeah no I've got quite a few tips on this um <laughs> the thing that I think is a really good approach is to kind of is to work backwards so the thing is what what people do they spend ages sometimes they write the title first and then they spend, they spend ages writing the post itself and then the title is this kind of quick throwaway thing and then they maybe just do a tweet that matches the title and, and that's that but what I think is really important is to see things from the user's perspective, the reader's perspective, which could be that they see something that someone's tweeted, then they make this, the decision, will I read that? Okay, I might do, so they click on it. And then like on an article from Max that we just saw, then they read that really great title, then they read that little bit of text underneath, and then they're reading on. Whereas for you as the writer, you spent all the time on that bit, and you know, you've really sort of sweated over that particular paragraph. But the thing is, unless you make the title really good and that subheading really good, then people aren't going to get to that bit. So I always think it's good to, to sort of see things, almost flip it around. So you're seeing it in the other, other order as people are reading the thing. So um, titles, for example, um, I always think, well, however long you're spending writing a title, then triple it. You know, I like to come up with, say, 15 different titles. Um, and just, you know, just write them all down. Don't, don't sweat it too much. Just come up with a load um, and really try and think of something that is going to give people a real kind of tease, you know, to give them a few keywords so they know it's not just a match report. There's something that, that hints at what is to come, that there is some controversy. It tells them who is playing. Um, all of those things, if you take it out of the post itself and then put it near the top. So, so yeah, in terms of the um, general approach that works, I tend to start with just a working title, just so that I know roughly what it's about. Um, then I write the thing and then I go back through it and I structure it better. So I add in more line breaks, I add in some subheadings, I space it out to make the whole thing more readable. Um, and then I go back to the title itself and really have a good look at that and really think, 
I move things around, I add more punctuation in, um, I put maybe some of the keywords near the beginning of the title so that when people are scrolling through, maybe they're just looking on their phones and it's really small, then they see that. Um, so yeah, and just as well, just one further point in that as well, with titles, it's really important to make them work so they stand alone. Um, ben, can you just quickly show that example? Is it the cricket one you want it's to It's the cricket one, just scroll yeah. down to where it says ugly duckling. Uh, the ugly duckling, ducklings, yeah. So this is just a random blog that I found today, a cricket blog. And, and this is a really great example of what I think is a bad title. So the ugly ducklings, which is great for the guy that wrote this because he knows what that refers to, but none of us looking at this know because we don't know what it's about. Um, so if you have maybe a colon after that and then something that kind of, that complements it and fills in the gaps, then all of a sudden it becomes something that you could click on. And this guy might have spent like three days putting this together and going back and editing it and, and going over it. And I don't want to click on it because I don't know what's it about, what it's about. It's too abstract. Whereas, could you just show the other, uh, it was a, was it a football blog? And just scroll down a bit through some of these um, examples. Okay, so understanding the unknowable, that on its own sounds quite interesting, but you don't know if it's about cricket, football, uh, painting and decorating, you know, science or whatever. But because it's got Zinedine Zidane at the start, then, oh, okay, I, I understand this. Um, you know, I can see what this is about. So trying to, when we're talking about the approach to blogging, thinking in this kind of reverse order, thinking about how important the title is and making sure that pulls out the best bits of the blog and encourages people to, um, to click on it. It gives them context. Um, it gives them some sort of sense of urgency or topicality or helpfulness, then that's, that's really, um, really important, I think. Brilliant. Thank you. Max, um, what about this piece that you did for, for the Kobe Bryant piece that you mentioned earlier? So the race to grieve, how social media has made professional mourners of us all. Like, um, how did you think about this as a whole piece? Because the previous one we just sort of discussed was very much like I was in Madrid, I ended up here. Um, what about this one? How did you think about constructing this, if you can remember? So I think it's, it's really interesting because all of those points that you were making were about like the formatting and the title and the subtitle mm -hmm. and all those things, which for this, I have no control over, right? I send an email, <laughs> the, the text is in a body of an email and I sort of write, hope this is all right, send and then pray that they don't reply with notes and edits. So, but what's interesting is the difference with so so when you sort of said, write the thing, that's the only bit that I'm doing. Mm. And the difference between this piece and the Champions League piece, because there there's no right way to write the article, the main body of the text. With the, um, with the Champions League one, I literally just sat there and wrote it and it just came out as a stream of consciousness and it had a natural structure without really thinking about it. I'm not saying I didn't go back and edit it and go back in and go back out. With Kobe Bryant, actually, uh, it was a much more uh, sort of strategic tactic, if I think about it, and I hadn't really thought about how I planned it, was I would have two Word documents either side. And on the left, I've got the actual one that I'm writing. And on the right, I've got kind of notes. And on the right, I would put right, sort of almost just throwing out ideas, kind of what, what bits do I want to get into this subject? So with Kobe Bryant I want to talk about like that idea that we're forced to we're sort of under pressure to 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 say that we're sad about somebody dying you know this idea that paragraph there you know social media has made a just up a bit has made us like professional mourners of all of us there's this race to have the most compassion you're sort of asked why you're not saying you're sad about this thing or you're not sad about this thing and if you say you're sad about one person why are you not saying you're sad about another person and so i put a little note there that i wanted to say that and then i and then i would put a note that i wanted to mention that people on the podcast had asked us that and i would write a note somewhere else about the bit at the top about this weird time in history where you know you could get paid to be a professional mourner right and and just turn up at and you know the fact that it still existed in Essex until last year right it just that what a weird thing that that is but it existed but I didn't have that this rent a mourner thing I don't think I found that until I'd probably written the piece so on my on the right of the page I was just kind of throwing I guess 
subheadings or a paragraph or trying to work out the structure you know it's a bit like writing an essay at school you know this is or at university that's what i had to do was have an introduction a middle and a conclusion and in that piece as well i quote so i basically got the idea from a podcast i'd listened to that was recorded um it's called stadio it's a really good pod actually and um I listened to them literally like in the hours after it happened and listened to how raw they were because they were both huge basketball fans. And that got me into thinking about the whole idea of it. And then if you see, there are sort of personal notes in this. So I was at Sky when Ugo Ehiog died and, and Merce, Paul Merson, who I used to work with, was just thrown on Sky Sports News without anybody really thinking about it. So I wanted to write that paragraph and then I was at TalkSport the day Gordon Banks died and wanted to get into sort of that idea that 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 you know some assistant producer who might be 21 like we found out at five to ten and then someone's got to ring up Bob Wilson and Bob Wilson might not even know that Gordon Banks has died so he's got to tell him and then ask if he'll come on the radio and that's a kind of insight that I see that most people listening to the radio aren't really thinking Oh, we've got to book this person. So I was on the on the on my screen on the right hand side. I was just dotting down all these things, and on the left I was sort of crafting the the article. And so it was a mu it took much longer, um, probably because the subject matter deserved to be taken much longer. And also, like in this, you know, at the I wanted to add in the section about his rape, the 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 rape accusation, and and that that it never went to court, which is obviously a very it's a very emotive thing and a very difficult thing to, to bring up. But that was a big part of the whole story about, you know, a human being's existence being a, a whole rather than we can just focus on them being a brilliant sportsman and ignore the rest of their career. But it was a much more sort of forensic, strategic, I'm making it sound much more complex than it, than it was, but it was, you know, plan it on the right, write it on the left, I guess. And so I think over time, you will just work out what writing style works for you. And most of the time I have a little notes page and I have the bit on the left and then I write the article on the left. And sometimes it really flows and sometimes you're like, oh, this is rubbish. And then you move things around and it's okay. Or hopefully. I pick up on that a little bit as well. Cause I think that's a really good point. It's almost like having beeps that you've got to hit. So don't worry about, you know, crafting these perfect paragraphs, first of all. Like Max is saying, you know, you just put, make some really simple bullet points. Like you want to talk about this, you want to tick that particular topic off. And then you can play with the narrative structure. So I'm a big fan of going in straight in the middle. So you don't have to start with this kind of, oh, then I got up in the morning and then this is what happened throughout the day. You know, this very, very linear approach. And I think it's really interesting how Max, you know, you had these things that you wanted to cover. And then at the end, then you discovered this random order thing. So that went in right at the beginning. And as it is, that makes it so strong because it's just so, so interesting. Um, and so you don't have to ne necessarily write in this kind of this way, you know, like you're not a novelist. So don't worry about making people read line by line to get to this amazing conclusion at the end. Sometimes you can start with the conclusion, put that right at the beginning and then people are working backwards. So, you know, you, you can play, play with it. You write that paragraph, you move that to the top, you move that underneath. Um, yeah. So don't, don't always feel like you've got to do this. A, B, C sort of sort of structure. Yeah, and you don't have to make every sentence brilliant. Yeah, That's and cool. often the ones that you That's really cool, sweat over are the ones you should delete, you yeah. know, or, or the ones that, yeah, you really struggle over, you realise, um, actually, no, it's the one after that. That's the problem. <laughs> that one's good, but it's that one that's rubbish. Did, did you have the end in mind for this piece, Max? Uh, which, which is... I don't know actually because I think I think <laughs> I think the I think I don't actually come to an answer in this piece which is which is kind of we don't really know how to do it we're all navigating like grief is something really none of us talk about and when you add social media into that it just makes it really complicated and what you need is time so I don't know how strong the end is but I guess the whole idea was to make you kind of think I suppose and um so, so no, I didn't actually. I knew I wanted to talk about it. I didn't necessarily have the end in mind. I don't know if the end is the strongest bit of it or not. So no, I didn't. Well, that's all right. But um, in that case, yeah, like Sue said, if, you've, if, you, if you're kind of looking for an answer, then maybe if you front load what you're talking about, 
to get everybody interested, then you can kind of work your way through it as you go. Whereas if you've got more of a journey piece, like your first piece, you know, there's an obvious kind of beginning and end there, isn't there? Whereas like, I'm in well, 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 also it sort of depends on, you know, like I specifically don't want to be a really opinionated um, broadcaster, writer, whatever, you know, I want to be able to change my mind and I want to be able to be open-minded to other people's opinions. There are lots of broadcasters and writers whose sort of raise on detra is, I think this, I'm right, ring me up and tell me why I'm wrong. And that's like good for them, but it's just not, I don't, you know, that doesn't mean I don't have strong opinions about some things, but it's just not, that's not kind of what I want to do. Cause I don't think it's particularly helpful generally. I don't think it makes for brilliant radio or, or written stuff. But I think sometimes putting it out there saying, well, this is how I feel about this, but how would you handle this? You know, what's your expertise here can actually make a really good post that's essentially a trigger for social media discussion and can get you a bit more engagement. And yeah, you don't have to have all the answers to everything. Um, but to write in that kind of very open way to, to be quite honest and say, yeah, this is how I feel, but I don't know, what, what about you? Can be quite appealing as well. You know, I wouldn't do it with every single post. Because <laughs> then you look like you don't know what you're talking about. But but the occasional kind of bit of humility to say, yeah, come on, let's all talk about this can actually be quite good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, what about okay? So when you've got your piece, your carefully crafted or not so carefully crafted piece. Um, so how, how how do you go about making it visible? How do you go about sharing it beyond obviously just whacking it on social? This is something that people forget to do quite a lot. So particularly say with video content. So, you know, you spend all this time putting it together that it's easy to forget that you've got to actually share it now. So people, people watch it. Um, it's good to have a mailing list. So some sort of automated thing on your website that encourages people to sign up. So that's very good. Uh, make sure that you share it on social media. So we tend to share blog posts, it's not an exact science, but we'll do it when it's first written. We'll schedule it for later on that day. So it hits a different time zone. Um, and then we might schedule it a bit later on in the week and we tend to rewrite the, the text with it um, each time as well. And we tend to, we'll write it differently for each platform. So Facebook, we might write it in a particular way. It's a bit more kind of friends and family kind of fun kind of way. LinkedIn, we might pull out a different angle from the post and write it differently there. Sometimes we don't even share it on every single platform. You know, sometimes it feels more like a LinkedIn thing than Twitter. Um, but we tend to if the title's really strong, then we'll share that or we'll pull out a little little nugget from it and, <clears throat> you know, like share the most uh, controversial element or ask a question around it. Or another favourite tip of mine as well is to um, find a really good quote from the piece and just make that the, the caption for Twitter. And if it's that strong and then it just stands alone and makes people go, oh, this, this is interesting. Um, so, yeah, so the social media channels, um, Instagram, it's quite nice to do a little Instagram do your main Instagram post, but then do a story with a big arrow on it or something that says new post, new post. And then that gets on the top of people's feeds. Um, it's good practice as well to pin it to the top of your social media feed as well. So anybody that's coming uh, to you fresh can see that as a top piece of content. So yeah, uh, what have we got? We've got um, mailing list, social media. If it's really good, you wanna get a lot of response then you could put some money behind it on social media. Um, works for some posts, might not work for all of them. Um, but yeah, you, if, if you build up this kind of mix of formats, then on your podcast, you'll mention your blog, on your blog, you'll mention your Instagram, on your mailing list, you'll be driving people to the website. So they all kind of, you know, they all need to be promoting each other all the time. Um, so having a blog at the core of that is really great because then that's that original content that you've got that um, gives you something that you're sharing in the first place. Just to keep with you for the minute as well, because uh, there's something you mentioned earlier, when once you've built up a bit of a, like say, I mean, a body of work, it could be loads of different things that you have, like you might have your podcast or your YouTube or your Instagram, or whatever it is. But actually earlier you mentioned about maybe making your own kind of little Wikipedia almost, like linking your, your pieces together. Like if you just talk to us about that a little bit. No, Sue? Oh, sorry, did you tell me Max or Sue? No, you, Sue. Oh, but sorry. <laughs> Um, well, I suppose you, your central point is going to be, it's usually the website, so you'll need everything on there. Um, and it's good practice within your blog to link to other blog posts that you've got. Um, Google is on a very basic level. It likes to see, it likes content that people are linking to because it, it proves that it's interesting. 
So um, a little minor thing that you can do is link to your own posts more often. Um, and again, linking from the uh, mailing list is very good. But yeah, most people tend to have the website as a central point and then your sort of your bank of podcasts that you might have and then and then the blog as well. Um, and then they're all kind of kind of promoting each other. I tend to find people tend to sort of gravitate towards one format and everything supports that. So some people might be naturally great at podcasting and then everything, maybe the blog post goes with each podcast um, or maybe they're really good on video pieces and then the blog might be related to that. So, you know, don't feel that you've got to be absolutely proficient and, you know, churning out loads of content across the different formats. Um, it might be that you're just, you know, more of a, an Instagram kind of person. And, and I think, you know, you can't force yourself to do things that you don't want to do. So find your little area that you, you do genuinely, genuinely enjoy creating content in and really focus on that and it will kind of fall into place. Um, but if you're, say if you're quite a visual person, then you might not be so keen on blogging because you may not be so keen on writing and you might find that doing more of a visual kind of continual update about your life and Instagram just suits you more. So, um, yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to stick with what gives you pleasure because then that will mean that you keep it up. Um, you know, you, you shouldn't feel that you're forcing yourself to do something that you don't really want to, don't want to do. The only thing I'd say is, um, like, I, I presume that not everyone who's following me, for example, is staring at their screen at the moment I press send, right? So, like, I'm not necessarily afraid to post a thing a few times. You don't want to, like, bore the hell out of people. But if you think you've done something good, there's no harm in sending, at, sending it out four or five times, you know, because people, if they've seen it already, they might just ignore it. Someone might say, look, you've sent that out enough times. We know you like it. Shut up. But... <laughs> People will always say that to you on social media anyway. So like, like the, sometimes you sort of think all your followers are just waiting for you. Mm. They're probably doing things that are interesting in their own lives most of the time, right? And unless you catch them sitting on the toilet, they're not going to be looking at your Twitter feed. I do think I mean, people don't notice when you're not there. They only notice you when you are there. Um, and so that's why when people write blog posts and they say, oh, it's been nearly two weeks since my last post. Well, settle on down and get a cup of tea. And, you know, no one has noticed. And in the same way, if you haven't tweeted all day, no one's noticed that either. They're only noticing the things that you are saying. Um, and so because particularly with Twitter, things move so quickly. If you do share the same post more than once, then I wouldn't worry too much about people feeling that, oh, they've seen this before. And particularly if you rewrite it slightly, rewrite the text. Um, yeah, like you say, people people aren't, they're not sitting there waiting, like, hang on, he posted that last post uh, Monday at three o'clock, so where is it? People aren't doing that. Without getting too deep into it, I know, um, you know, some of our foremost public officials rewrite their posts quite long after. They... I know, it's crazy. <laughs> Wouldn't believe it, would you? <laughs> so um, there's a really good question that's just come in as well for, uh, for both of you. So if you're known for writing about a specific niche topic or area, how do you go about writing um, or branching out into a different topic? I would maybe do it somewhere else. So if, you, if you've if you got your own blog and it's about a particular topic and you want to try something different, maybe try a lengthy LinkedIn post or Medium or someone else's blog or something. I don't know. That's my instinctive response. And then you can kind of, you're in a different uh, house, if you like. You know, you're in a different structure. So it will help you write differently. Um, it depends. It depends how personal your own blog is, though. Because if, it, if it's very personal about you, then... I mean, you know, you can do what you like. <laughs> I mean, really, it's your blog. So if you do want to kind of go off piste and, and just say, right, well, I normally talk about this, but you know what? Today, I'm feeling more, I don't know, emotional, or I really want to talk about this thing that's in the news, then it is, it is your blog. So, you know, I, I think there's no hard and fast rules, to be honest. Great. Thank you. What about you, Max? What, do you ever feel kind of that you need to stick to, yeah, I suppose football or, you know, I know you've done the Kobe piece, but how do you go about sort of broaching some other topics um i think you just do it don't you you do it and you hope people will accept it i think you do <clears throat> you know we do pigeonhole people right you know if if i don't know if trevor mcdonald or hugh edwards did like the best 10 minute stand-up set you would spend all of it going you're a newsreader what are you doing you know and so you would be like this better you know it would have to be so good for you to really or or, or you know if Michael McIntyre was reading the 10 o'clock news, you'd be like, this is weird, right? <laughs> so, so like, obviously, 
there's a certain level where you can probably only do what you want to do, right? If you're Bono, it's going to be tricky to just start doing co-coms on, you know, the Bundesliga. But for most <laughs> of us, we're not sort of at that level, right? So pretty much you can sort of do what you like. And if people go, why did you do that? I didn't like it. I mean, they might, they, in my experience, people are just as likely to say that about me writing or talking about football as they are I me mean, talking about cricket or, you know, art house punk music. Like, like somebody's always going to say they don't like it. So I, I tend to agree, just like, I guess you've got to, in this field, certainly you've got to, from my experience in the media, you've got to talk about stuff that you're interested in and that you like. And, if you, and that you're vaguely knowledgeable about, right? Because, because A, sports fans are very unforgiving and they'll know if you're trying to bluff. And, you know, so I'm very open. You know, I don't like Formula One and I don't pretend to like it. I don't like boxing. I don't pretend to like it. I can still ask questions on the radio about it, but I can't emote about it because I just think I don't want to watch that car. Or I don't want to see that man get punched in the face. But... But I think if you're honest about whatever it is you're doing, then you're, you're probably okay. And if you're not, there are one or two people who forged really long careers in the media who are not, who are totally different off air or off, off the page. But it's very rare because it would just be so tiring, right? You know, like you've got to just be you and hope people like it. And if they don't, that's tricky. And, you know, not everyone will regardless of what you do. Can I ask you a question, Max, on, yeah. on that topic then? Yes. So how does that shape what you're writing? Either feedback that you, you've seen that, that you've already had in or the feeling that, oh God, this is how people are going to respond to this. Because the sort of blogs that I put out there, they tend to be more for like a, a, like a businessy audience. So it's not the same thing. So does that ever I, make you I change your mind about your writing? or? don't care. Like, like <laughs> I've just had enough. Like, like... I've had enough abuse, right? You just get abuse, right? It doesn't matter who you are. Like David Attenborough gets it, right? So like no one is, no one is free from getting it. And I think, I, I, I sort of joke that I'm glad Twitter didn't exist when Soccer AM started. And, I re and actually I genuinely mean it because I wasn't very good when I started and I would have found the criticism really tough. And now I certainly with broadcasting, I'm sort of confident in what I'm doing. Not everyone likes it, that's fine. But I, I sort of, you know, I finish a show and they're not all brilliant, but I feel comfortable that I know what I'm doing. With my writing, I'm less experienced and I'm less confident. So I am probably more like, I would take criticism more seriously because I think they might have a point sometimes, but I think I've just had an, you know, and actually it varies massively. There are people at TalkSport, presenters who literally don't have the message screen turned off. They just can't, they can't see it because whatever you're doing, someone will send a tweet in capital letters saying you're the worst thing that's ever existed, right? But I find it funny, right? So <laughs> just wasting their time telling me this. So I, I, I guess you just get, you get a thick skin eventually from it. But it doesn't, I certainly, it doesn't influence what I'm, you know, you want people to like what you're saying, but you've got to say what you're gonna say. And hopefully you don't, it, it's, it's, like you don't always say exactly what you're feeling about something, right? You have to be sort of political about something sometimes. Um, or there's no need to be unduly harsh if you don't like somebody. Like, for example, if you take over, you know, after someone's show and you're doing the next show, if you think their show is a shower of shit, you don't say, thanks very much. I didn't enjoy that. Here's the news. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be funny, but it's not going to help you. So like you can say nothing and that's fine. But I, I tend to think you've just got to, you've got to get a thick skin. Look, if you've been a professional sports person, you've probably got some abuse, right? I mean, we're not talking to a crowd who don't know about this. And the, the, that stick face to face, I think is much worse than anything you're going to get online. Certainly that's how I feel. I mean, hand over like that's very Alan Partridge, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dave Clifton. But we've got, we've got another really good question as well. So I'm currently studying sports writing and broadcasting, looking to make a start in that industry. How would I use blogs to elevate my chances of employment in and around that? And I suppose that could really apply, you know, beyond the sports writing industry. But uh, yeah, Sue, what about what about that? How would you use a? How do you go about well, that? Well, in my my little corner of the world, which is digital marketing, then I'm always looking for proof that people can actually do the job. 
And that for me is not always they've got a degree from whatever university and they've done this module in and that module. You know, I want to see that someone can actually write or that they can do a social media caption or that they've got some sort of interest. And so a blog is such a brilliant little springboard for you, a little platform, you know, for you to show that you are genuinely interested in this. I mean, maybe it's more um, like sports, uh, the health side of it, you know. So if you can explore this, this area in depth, it's such a brilliant way to show that you do, you are genuinely interested in it. And particularly, I mean, it's so competitive nowadays anyway. So, um, you know, there's so many people sending in CVs. The ones that are gonna stand out are the people that show, yep, yeah, they've got a genuine interest because they're outside of everything else. They're taking time to explore it and write about it. So um, yeah, people just starting out, you know, never feel that it's all about the qualifications. If there's anything that you can do to sort of prove this genuine, genuine interest, that's really good. And a blog is, is brilliant for doing that. And then the other thing is that if you haven't got much out there in terms of your kind of online portfolio, then that is going to show up. So there, there'll be LinkedIn, um, there'll be that. Uh, if you've had some sort of awful story written about you in the tabloid press, then you need to get a lot of blog content out there to try and push that on down. Um, but it, it can put something out there when previously there, there's nothing, you know? So I think it's a great idea. Max, what about you? What do you think about it, given that you, you get to dabble in that? Um, so what was the question again? <laughs> so, no, um, how would someone use blogs to get into kind oh, of... Oh, yeah. Um, um, a sports I, I, gig? I think it's... Look, it just shows exactly what you said. Like, the, A, you'll practice, so you'll get better at it. B, um, someone will say, what have you got? And you show them. So, it's, so it may cut through anyway. So if you're writing stuff that's good, it might cut through and you might get some retweets or some, you know, you'll get some views and whatever. So that's good in itself. I, you'll get spotted. But B, if people haven't spotted it, at least they'll see that you have a body of work and, you'll, and it'll just get you better at it. You know, like, like I, I, I sort of go to schools, universities and talk about radio and stuff and they've got student radio or whatever. It's, it's exactly the same. There's no difference between doing a radio show in your shed and doing the Radio One Breakfast Show ostensibly. It's a microphone, some headphones and just you. And it's the same principle as writing. You know, the, if you write something and you send it to your mate, 800 words, it's the same as somebody writing it and it being published in the back of the Times or whatever. It's just where it's gone and so the principle and the actual skill of it and the art of it and how you how you create it is identical and so in a way that makes it you know i think the real difficulty is just getting on with it you know like all these everyone on here could write a blog this afternoon but it's quite sunny and it's sort of you know it's nearly it's the middle of the week like it's almost friday right so it's much easier for example, to sit in that nice garden and just get a drink, but you could do it, but are you gonna do it? You know, I could like, for example, I haven't written a piece for a couple of weeks. I could write one and I'm not going to. So like, so like <laughs> do as I do, not as I say, it is just, the, it is, you know, it's as much doing it. So, you know, I, you know, radio was what I got into and radio was, you know, I was a reporter for the BBC, but I was, getting in at four in the morning and doing my shift till midday and then staying downstairs, making demo tapes for hours and hours and sending them off and sending them off until Kiss said, come and do a demo. And then I listened and I didn't like the music and I couldn't, that was too noisy. And then, you know, Radio One got me for a pilot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there are lots of people who are good enough to do it. You've got to get on with it and do it basically. Because the consistency is the other thing, right? So it's like, you can do the one, you could do the one brilliant one, but that's kind of unlikely. Um, you know, for a first effort, but to yeah. actually build a body of work is it just demonstrates some commitment. Also, also, you find out if you like it, right? You know, you write one piece about something of your career that you thought, and actually, the process of writing is quite lonely. It's not; it's totally different to the process of broadcasting. And so, which do you thrive in, right? Which do you because because you want to enjoy what you're doing, right? You know, especially if you've come from professional sport, which is like it's a very tricky. That's the whole point of this you know this enterprise right is is to navigate that jump from something quite extreme and quite focused to something else and that's a very difficult you know that's something that you probably love doing so then you need to find something else that you really enjoy and you can only do that by doing it right brilliant okay well 
guys, um, I don't think there are any more questions. So yeah, we could wrap it up. I mean, thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. That's thank right. you, everybody. I hope that was vaguely useful. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> you say that now, right? Then we leave and then... Yeah, you, you're going to go and they'll be like, oh, oh yeah, it's a radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank true. you, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.